Thank you, Larry. That's one of my favorite songs. It's one of my favorite people songs. That one. And other than yeah, it's beautiful. You know, speaking of, uh, Rick was talking about a guy who believes in past lives. Speaking of past lives, do you know what Adam, the first man, Alexander the Great, and Abraham Lincoln all have in common? They all dated Shirley MacLaine. <laughs> Been a while since Shirley. <laughs> oh my. Yeah. Okay. Well, what a blessing. Uh, it's good to have you all here today, especially you first time people. And Renda, do you mind if I just share what you what you told me? Yeah. Uh, Renda, uh, this is her first Sunday that she's come here and Max with her. Uh, she came in and I said, what, what brings you in here? And she said she had a near death experience. Uh, she came close to dying. Uh, she grew up in, uh, in a Baptist church, an assembly of God, and then just kind of ignored the Lord. And uh, that got her charged to come back. You know? And I said, you know how blessed you are? Because there are people like the 10 lepers that they get healed and you know they're basically on their way they're, they're, they've got a death sentence when you have leprosy and and they and jesus restores them and one comes back and gives them thanks and and so that is so, such a blessing that, that your heart is tender enough to say yes yeah yeah so you know it's a wonderful life and that's what we're going to talk about today it's a wonderful life great title for a movie isn't it <laughs> and it is a wonderful life Isaiah 9, 6, we hear the scripture so much. Oh, let me just pause for a minute because I don't know if Stephanie made this announcement. But um, in, in the back, uh, the point my mind went into a, a free frame. Scott in the back. <laughs> the other Scott. Scott that's in the back. Stand up, Scott, just so people can see you. Uh, he does tech work. So if any of you have anything technical stuff like your phones or anything that needs worked on, uh, Scott would like to uh, have that as a ministry. He'll... he'll help you he'll do it you know free of charge people so any kind of your technical things so yeah that'll make your life a lot more wonderful because these technical things are not so wonderful but they are wonderful but anyway back to the sermon <laughs> Isaiah 9 6 we hear this time of year and uh, we read this for to us a child is born to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And this word wonderful appears all through Scripture. In Psalm 31, 21, it tells us that God it encourages us to, to praise God for his wonderful love. And how many know God's love is truly wonderful? The fact that I'm still standing here... <laughs> You know, against the Old Testament, we see that some of the things we have all participated in required, you know, meant death. <laughs> so, his love is wonderful. Psalm 107, 8 and elsewhere says this, Let us give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds to men. You know the problem with some of us when we get depressed? We don't stop and sit and think about the wonderful things God's done. You know, just take a walk, like Stephanie and I I'll frequently walk in the morning, and just in the desert and see the beauty. And let me tell you, uh, the, the desert wasn't God's best work, you know. <laughs> it's all beautiful, but I mean, you know, but even here in the desert, because the desert is known to, you know, we don't have the water, that we don't, so it's not like when you go back to where I grew up, Pennsylvania, that's, you know, breathtaking, or some of the other states, but they, you know, but it's wonderful. We look at these things that grow in the desert, and wow! And in addition, in addition to the things of our own life, but I want to. We can look at many, many things in Scripture. But I want to look at one incident quickly. It's in um, Luke's Gospel, chapter thirteen. If you have your Bibles and you want to mark this, chapter thirteen of Luke. One incident of something wonderful that Jesus did among all these wonderful, wonderful things throughout the Gospels. And we read this. On the Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues. And a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. Now, when the Bible says 
that someone was crippled because of a spirit, that's what it means. That wasn't written because we didn't understand, they didn't understand in those days, medical things, because the Holy Spirit put us together, you know. So sometimes there are things that are spiritual that will cause physical infirmities. And this woman for 18 years has been crippled by a spirit, and if you think about it, if we were dealing with a situation today, you know, some sort of sickness or illness, it would mean that this has gone on since 1998. Now that's a long time to go through something, and especially to be crippled and bent over and not able to move right. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward. And just picture this woman, she's coming toward Jesus because she'd be hobbling, you know, trying to, trying to make her way. And he said to her, you are set free from your infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Can you see this scene? You know, if you've ever had any kind of sickness or illness or problem and it ends immediately and you know it was God, that, there's just nothing like that. And what I love about this is that this woman, when she's healed, immediately, what does she do? Praise God. She's praising God. And imagine anybody who was with her friend or a family member who was in the synagogue with her at this time indignant because Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath the synagogue ruler said to the people there are, now he's talking he's like Jesus I'm picturing Jesus behind this man and he's talking to everybody who just watched this and he says there are six days uh, for work so come and be healed on those days, not the Sabbath. He's lecturing them, but you know what he's doing? He's really talking to Jesus. Now, meek and mild Jesus that we all have heard about in Sunday school. Yeah. He's just this little figure with a halo and a blue tunic. And he's so beatific looking and he just never gets upset. <laughs> And he's so seeker friendly. <laughs> the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Doesn't each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or donkey from the stall and lead it out to give it water? Then should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath from what bound her? Let me tell you something. That's Jesus got righteously angry. And let me tell you, he let people have it with both barrels. So when people leave a church because they got all upset because the pastor said something that stepped on their toes, you know, that, that can happen. But Jesus wasn't worried about stepping on toes when it came to truth. When he said this, all his opponents were humiliated. Yay! <laughs> oh, don't make me say anything politically. Alright, I'm going to hold on myself here. His opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with all the wonderful things he was doing. Everything Jesus did was wonderful. Everything about the Lord is wonderful. Everything he does is wonderful. 1 Peter 2.9 says this, and we've read this frequently, but you know what? We need to get this into our thick skulls. <laughs> all of us. People, listen to this. You are a chosen people. A royal priesthood. Put your shoulders back and your heads up. A holy nation. Do the royal wave. Yeah. A royal. Yeah. Yeah. You're a chosen people. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A people belonging to God. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. His light is wonderful. You know, I was thinking about light. You know, the worst time when you're going through a problem is nighttime. You know, the night settles in and your emotions, 
You know, a, a problem is always twice as bad at night. And I used to be not a good flyer. You know, I it just was. I would, I would worry about a flight that we were going to be traveling somewhere to perform for for a, a month, two months. I'd have bad dreams about it. And then we go. And if the, if the flight was at night, oi, oh, you know. So I would, you know, I was, and I would try to look calm because. As an entertainer, you always have to, you know, try to not look, you know, panicked. So, you know, I'd be gripping the seat and I'd be praying and, and, and at night I'd be looking out, if, if, you know, for landing places. You know, even during the day I did that. But I remember certain night flights and, and it would just be like, you know, every little bump and, you know, can't see any place to land. And, and then the sun would start to come up, you know, oh, light, you know. Now, if that thing had plummeted from the sky during the daytime, wouldn't have you know, been any better than at night, but it, you know, the light just made me feel so much better. And this time of year, Christmas lights, isn't it beautiful? You know, not just in here, but you know, and, and so much of many of the lights in the Christmas displays are just secular stuff, but, but I love to look at them. You know, those beautiful lights, beautiful light in this dark winter. And God's light is wonderful, and we're living in that wonderful light. And I love, and I use this scripture frequently, John 10.10 10 from the Amplified Bible, Jesus said, I came that they may have and enjoy life, have it in abundance to the full, till it <laughs> overflows. I mean, oh, you know, it just went popping up. <laughs> if you belong to Jesus, people, you've been called and are in fact entitled to and should be experiencing a wonderful life. And don't get confused here. See, if, if I just thought the sermon right now because of my persuasive way of speaking, and these beautiful scriptures we've looked at, you'd all go home like feeling, you know, all good. But then you'd get out into the parking lot and real life would set in, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe, you know, you'd, you'd turn the car on and a light would show up on your dashboard or, or or maybe you go to lunch at McDonald's because you feel like you deserve a break today. And you wouldn't get a break today. Because one of those teenagers that are working for minimum wage and wants $15 would maybe get something wrong, you know. And you get that special sauce you said to leave off, you know. So things aren't always going to go right. But a wonderful life doesn't mean a problem-free life. It's wonderful in spite of, and I'm going to add this, because of, because of difficulties and problems. Phyllis's heat went out last week. Went out and the apartment people came and the repairman came and, and it just happened to be one of those things that they needed a special part for, so she was without heat. And it took a while for them to get the part, and she's sitting in a cold place. And I think they gave her a space heater, and she went and bought a space heater. And it was days without heat when, it, when it's cold, you know. And the apartment people were telling her, oh, no, you got to pay your full rent, you know. This is real life. That's real, real life. However, <laughs> God gives us a wonderful light in spite of the disappointing and the painful and the unpleasant events because it's all just part of a much, much bigger picture. 2 Corinthians 4.17 says this, For our light and momentary troubles, and this is the Apostle Paul, who went through prison and lysings and having to run from enemies, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. We don't understand a lot of these times when things aren't lovely. But it reminded me when you're a kid and you hate to do something like practice the piano or wear braces and your mother says, just wait, it's going to be worth it. You know, keep it up, it'll be worth it. You know, And that's what it's like. There's a, there's a momentary thing and you get those braces off and you have straight teeth or you keep at that piano playing and you can play piano as an adult. Light and momentary troubles. It's a wonderful life, and that's why this Christmas I'm encouraging to watch Frank Capra's film, It's a Wonderful Life. It's a wonderful life. Now, 
You're going to say, Pastor Bill told us to go and watch a silly Christmas film. But, and it is just a fictional story. It's fictional. But what did Jesus do when he was teaching? He told fictional stories. He told parables to give us, they were pictures that gave us, helped us understand the principle. And that's what watching It's a Wonderful Life will do for you. So I would ask it this way. How many of you in here have, have never seen It's a Wonderful Life? Oh! Well, that shouldn't surprise me because this is the first year I actually watched The Grinch That Stole Christmas. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's been out since 1966. <laughs> never got around to it. But, hey, so for those of you, get the movie. You know, you can find them all over Walmart and stuff right now. Get that movie. So, we're going to do a little review today. I know many of us have seen it many, many times. And you know what? When I watched that film, and I was watching it again because I've seen it many times, but I was kind of watching it in preparation for today, it makes me weep. Almost from the beginning now, because I know how everything's going to come out. It just makes me weepy. So let's review. George Bailey is the main character. Jimmy Stewart. Aye, 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 aye. Now, Mary, Mary, and uh, Jimmy Stewart was from my area, outside, Indiana, outside of Pittsburgh. So anyway, Jimmy Stewart is playing George Bailey, and George Bailey, as a young man, 18 years old, right out of high school, has big dreams for his life, big dreams. He wants to travel, he wants to go to Europe, and then he wants to go to college and become an architect, so he can go from city to city and build big buildings, skyscrapers, and bridges, and travel, and have an exciting life. He wants to be footloose and fancy free. The last thing on his mind at 18 is, is marriage and children. And mainly, he just wants to get out of the small town of Bedford Falls. You know, when I was leaving home at 21, finally, uh, as an entertainer, we were performing in the Pittsburgh area, and there were a few nightclubs there, and we did that. But I was just certain that coming out of Las Vegas and other cities in the world had to be so much more exciting than Fawn Township and Tarentum, Pennsylvania. I was wrong. <laughs> I was wrong, yeah. But that's another story, not the right one. Uh, <laughs> so his plans get waylaid, plans of college and all that stuff. Because his father needs help with a building and loan. Now his father just has this little business, it's a building and loan, it's not too exciting to do this, but he helps people in Bedford Falls get affordable housing, and, and it's quality housing. But he's been up against a giant in the city named Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter has a big building and loan. He also helps people get into housing, but it's inferior housing at high prices. His main desire is to own the people of Bedford Falls through debt. Any of you own, owned by debt to Visa or MasterCard? Or, and that's what he wanted to do. And especially, he was out to destroy the Baileys. Now, where in Scripture does it say that there's an entity that wants to destroy us? Um, hmm. So you see, there's more to this story than just the Grinch, okay? George's father, in time, uh, he's also waiting, George is waiting for his brother to finish his education. When his brother comes back from college, he's going to relieve George of the family business responsibilities. But all that changes. His father has a stroke. His brother comes back from college married. And so George, again, kind of sacrifices and stays on to keep the building and loan going simultaneously George reluctantly and unexpectedly falls in love and gets married and now he's got that anchor yeah it's funny how real life you know like having to have a job and pay bills just changes a whole lot of things when the pressures of his family business just seem to mount Mr. Potter offers George a position with his big company with an unbelievably big yearly salary and opportunities to travel and all the things he dreamed for, dreamed of, and it begins to turn George's head. It's a temptation. Mm -hmm. And then he realizes, in order to have the bigger salary and the bigger house and all this stuff, I'd have to compromise my 
principles. And he turns that down. So, you know, it's, there's, there's some really beautiful things about this character of George Bailey because he gives up his dreams to help his dad. He gives up his dreams to let his brother have a life with his new wife and a different business. And he gives up his dreams with the big money to continue living ethically and morally and helping the people in Bedford Falls. So what does he get for doing everything right? His uncle Billy goes to make the deposit at the bank for the building and loan. $8,000, which during the Second World War would have been a major, major, you know, hey, $8,000 to me right now is big money. But in that day, it was like $100,000. And he's making this deposit, and I don't know, he gets, you know, waylaid, talking to people and talking to Mr. Potter, and he wraps it in a newspaper, and he loses it, the $8,000. And this tragedy means the ruin of the building and loan, the ruin of George Bailey's reputation and his family life and possible jail time. And George Bailey decides that the only way out is to kill himself by jumping off a bridge in the dead of winter on Christmas Eve. George Bailey said that things would have been better had he never been born. We all know that. And his plans to commit suicide are disrupted by a guardian angel by the name of Clarence. <laughs> Clarence devises a plan to show George Bailey what the world would look like if he had never been born. Now, watching It's a Wonderful Life makes you and me think differently about our lives. How many in here, thinking back to when you were very young, teenager, early 20s, how many of you have that the dreams you were dreaming then that your life turned out just like you anticipated? Anybody? I used to drive at 16 years old in my senior year with Jeannie Miller, my little girlfriend, and we drive down to Pittsburgh along the Allegheny River, and Pittsburgh to me looked like the Emerald City. That was as far west, I mean, I'd been into Ohio, but I mean, that was like, yeah. So we drive into Pittsburgh, and as we drove toward the Emerald City of Pittsburgh, we would talk about what our lives were going to be like, and what our lives were going to be is we were going to eventually, after school and went to college, we were going to get married, and we were going to have four children, and Jeannie was an artist, and I, I like to write, and I was going to teach in a local high school, and I was going to write during the summers, and each one of our children was going to be in some sort of the arts, a musician, a dancer, a painter, and a writer, you know. No. Nope. <laughs> Completely different. <laughs> completely, completely, completely different. You know, we could look at examples in Scripture of people who had lives very similar, in fact, even worse than George Bailey, where their lives started out, they had a vision, and things went completely opposite from the vision. Joseph is a prime example. He not only had desires and dreams like George Bailey, but his dreams were given him by God, that he was going to be a ruler. And his family was going to bow down. And we all know what happened. His jealous brother sold him into slavery. He ends up in Egypt. And he doesn't end up having to work for Mr. Potter. He works for Mr. Potiphar, if you remember. He's a slave in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife looks at him. He's young. He's good looking. And she keeps inviting him to bed. She's seducing him. And he turns her down. Because his master trusts him and it would be a violation of God. Even though he's away from home, even though there's many reasons why, and humanly speaking, he should have taken her up on the offer. He does the right thing and what happens to him? He ends up in prison. In an Egyptian prison. And let me tell you something. I don't think Egyptian prisons in 2016 would be a favorite place to hang out. But I can tell you, back in this day, it would have been a stinking hellhole. And he was there many, 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 many years. And you know, when we, read, when we read in Genesis about Joseph's life, you can read it in one sitting. You can read it in a few minutes. But we're talking about a, a minimum of 17 years before his dream and a, and a maximum of 27 years before his dreams are full, really fulfilled. And I'm telling you, 
if you sit down and you think about it, there had to be times in that prison where Joseph wondered why he was ever born. He couldn't figure things out. In Frank Capra's film, when the angel showed George Bailey just a few of the things that would have been different were he never been born. We see that his brother, when they were kids, George rescued his younger brother when he fell into an icy pond while they were sled riding. And that brother grew up and went on to become a fighter pilot. And his maneuvers and heroics during the Second World War saved hundreds of lives. We see that the town druggist, when he found out years earlier when George was just a teenager and working for the druggist, the town druggist got news that his son had been killed in battle and he drank himself blind, drank himself, drowned, literally drowned his sorrows and then tried to fill a prescription that would have killed somebody. The angel showed him that had that happened, if George hadn't stopped that druggist from delivering that prescription, he would have been, this man would have ended up in prison for 20 years and a lifelong alcoholic. We see this beautiful town of Bedford Falls turned into Potterville and it's got saloons and strip joints and gambling halls. Can you imagine living in such a place? <laughs> God has reasons for directing us down alleys and around corners and sometimes in rapids and sometimes on the edge of the cliff and God understands better than any one of us why he keeps us in holding patterns at times and we're just going God how much longer yes. how much longer or sometimes says no to what we're sure would be just perfect for our life Jeremiah 29 11 we See, this, so many have this on a bumper sticker or on the refrigerator, but we don't really. If you really believe that when you got to the edge of the cliff, it would mean something. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in the future. See, it doesn't, this is what I love, this is why I know that this is so Holy Spirit. Because he's speaking to us. Plans to prosper you, and then he adds, and not to harm you, because we're all this, this is going to be the time when, you know, this is the time when God's going to, like Charlie Brown and Lucy, that he's going to pull off the football when I go to kick it, and I'm going to go, oh, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah, that's the third, <laughs> okay, and that's the end, all right. <laughs> God, like the old TV show title, Father Knows Best. After Joseph's 17 years of suffering, see what, we look at jo George Bailey's fictional life, but Joseph's real life uh, was, George Bailey's life was a walk in the park yep. compared to what Joseph went through. And 17 years of it, that suffering and that waiting, whether he knew it at the time, he was learning. He was being changed into God's, through God's orchestrated cocoon. And he became prime minister of Egypt. And the only way that could have happened, it wouldn't have been one second too soon. Two years earlier, remember he interpreted the dreams of the of the of Pharaoh's baker and his wine steward, or his cupbearer, and he tells the cupbearer, when you're restored to your position, remember me, and God makes the cupbearer forget. Trust me, that was a God thing. And then, two years later, because Joseph wasn't fully cooked, you know, and it's the same way with you and me. There are situations where you got to wait. And that's not a whole lot of fun. And we may not understand why things happen in our lives, but you can be sure that God is on his throne. And there's this same God who won't let one sparrow fall to the ground that he is not aware of, is aware of every single second and every event of your life in my life and nothing happens without God's permission and without God's directing. We aren't given the privilege of seeing what would happen or what life would be like if we hadn't been born. You know if Joseph hadn't been born we can be sort of this. There would have been millions and millions of Egyptians who would have been dead because 
of a famine that was coming. And these are people that are not God's people because God says he sends rain on the just and the unjust. He's concerned about all people, not just those whose hearts are twelve. That's the love of God. And of course, the nation of Israel would never have been able to survive either through that famine. And without the nation of Israel, we would not have had the Messiah that we're celebrating at Christmas time. God had his purpose, and without a doubt, he knew exactly why he let Joseph go through that. He knew why he chose Joseph out of all the people he could have chosen out of these other 11 brothers. There was a reason. And it wouldn't hurt for any of us to sit down this week and think about your life. And you know what? You'll never figure it all out because we won't. It'd be nice if we had an angel that would show us. But we can look at some of the things in our lives and say, yeah, just think a life would be different. When I was 16 years old, we were privileged because my father was an optometrist in an area where there were a lot of coal miners and steel mill workers. And so we had a little better life. We weren't probably upper middle class, but there were so many lower middle class. We had a swimming pool, which was a big deal back in the 60s in a climate like Pennsylvania. And I went up one time when I was 16. It was all ready in the summer to dive into the pool. I normally went with my sister and brother because we were just always connected, you know. And this day I thought, I'm just going to go out for a swim by myself. And I, and I normally go in on the shallow end and, you know, kind of get used to the water because this aren't, these aren't heated pools. Cold Pennsylvania summer nights and it's like cold water. But this day I thought, I'm just going to dive right in because you just dive in the, the deep end and, you, you know, once you get to the end of that lap, you're used to it. That's what I'm going to do. And I stood at the end of the swimming pool and was all ready to dive in and this little thought came into my head. Uh, just stick your toe in the water. Just test it. Okay. So I dipped on one leg and I swung my foot and my part of my foot went into the water and it was filled with electric current. Oh. And my, I remember I had a hard time pulling. It was just frozen. It just pulling. And then I remember the, we had some little frogs that were, that were dying. And we had a, a metal pipe, a little metal, uh, very narrow pipe that wet our sliding board, fiberglass sliding board. Every now and then you see a, a frog that would land on there and die. And there was electricity through the water. And I, I know when I get to heaven that God's going to say, there was an angel that spoke to you. I wouldn't be here. I would not be here. Man. When we uh, entered show business and came out here, we were with a show called The Mickey Finn Show for our first three years off and on from 1974 to 1977. I hated being in that show. He was no fun. He just put us through a lot of stuff. It was, we were like a tuxedo act and gown and that kind of thing. And, and funny, you know, we had other things, but we wanted to be... Uh, and this was kind of a honky-tonk, uh, you know. And it was just a, a lot of stuff I couldn't stand, and, and I didn't like him. Uh, he, he was just not a nice person. Don't put that on. Uh, <laughs> still alive somewhere. Uh, <laughs> But you know what those three years did? They seasoned us so that when we got our own, finally got our act on our own again, we could face anything on stage. And if it hadn't been the, for the last three months we were in that show, I had never met Stephanie. But, you know, funny how things just, God knows what he's doing, you know? I can't tell you the private anguish I went through. Those of you who know my testimony, the anguish I went through in my 20s and in my 30s and the sorrow and the private times of weeping and you know I'm an upbeat person trust me I'm, I'm an upbeat person so when I'm down you know and you know but this is one of God's promises Psalm 126 5 those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy those who sow in tears will reap with songs of joy. And I can tell you that the worst part of my life has brought me the most joy. It truly has. I would not trade what I went through, sort of like pr that prison. I can relate to Joseph in prison. I used to read the books of Corey Ten Boom because I thought if you can endure prison, I was in my own inward prison. And when I'm ministering to somebody, when I'm speaking to a crowd, 
to giving them understanding about what I went through and I see the light go on and the hope and the tears in their eyes and I sat with this 23 year old young man and I looked back and I thought 40 years ago I had nobody like me to sit with me and tell him there's hope and God is good and you're going to get through this and in spite of, of this sort of thing that seems sort of crippling you're going to have a wonderful wonderful life Real quickly, too. In the 80s, we're at the Holiday Casino on the Strip, which is now Harris. We're doing our act. And there's this other act called Willie and Strong. And uh, it's, it's Bill Witter. And they're doing an acrobatic thing and all kinds of stuff. And, you know, we show ended, never saw Bill. And then Bill and his wife have this clown business and party business. And uh, when things were lean in the, in the 90s, my sister would go over different times and pick up you could get $20 an hour going out and doing, uh, stand dressed like a clown and holding a sign that said apartment. You know, four hours of that and you got yourself $80. So, and I did that once in a while, but I never did it in hot weather like my sister did. <laughs> I enjoy my comfort. So anyway, so that was that. But I remember different times I'd leave their house. They were such nice people, Bill and Phyllis, and I would just pray for them. I'd just say, God bless them. And then we needed a clown Years later, this is back in the night. Now, years later, 2014, we're having an event and we decide we need a clown. And I don't know anybody else that does clowns except Bill and Phyllis Winters, who I call. And Phyllis says, okay, well, either I will be there for that event or my husband will be there. And Bill comes and he does a great job as a clown. And uh, he remember him looking around and saying, it's nice, I'll have to come here sometime. And that was in October. And then January, he calls me to minister to a woman who was suicidal when I go and I began to speak to her and tell her about Jesus and who's sitting beside me to my left unbeknownst to me I can feel him on my left but I'm talking to her Bill's dream, got tears streaming down his face and he comes to know the Lord Amen. yeah Amen. Oh, God. I always tell people all I, it wasn't because of anything special all I did was show up God did all the work just show up because it's a wonderful life and God's got your so one more story and we close. You know, we every year we uh, bring gifts over to the Walter Hoving ladies. We've been a church, well, this is our 13th year, and every year uh, the Walter Hoving Home is uh, a ministry that helps women get off drugs and alcohol. alcohol. They, it's a live-in program. They have one in New York, they have one in Pasadena, and they had a new one here. And we got on board when we were a new ministry and we began to give, and each year we would go into Christmas time to each of the women, there were normally 10 of them, and three staff members, this small church would give each woman a $100 gift card so they could have a Christmas. $1,300 from this small group. But this year, they added a few ladies, so now it was like $1,500 in gift cards, and I felt a little resentment because we have other things you know we now you know when we started doing this we didn't have a mortgage to pay or a lease to pay we didn't we weren't involved in other ministries and then i don't know if when i talked to sylvia about the night we were going to go over whether it was whether she made the suggestion or whether i suffered temporary insanity and said we'll bring dinner over that night we'll make it a party stephanie says it was probably you but i remember so Anyway, so now I'm kind of resentful because I'm going to spend some more money over at Costco, get sandwiches, and I bought stuff to make a macaroni salad with tuna fish, which is just blow your socks off. And uh, I make that thing, and we got chips, and we got drinks, and there's another $150. And then Stephanie made these little gift bags, and she took coupons to Bed Bath & Beyond and put things in, and then realized that, realized that was about $90, and there was only one thing in each basket. Well, now do we spend a little bit more, or do we, how do we fill up these... So another 90. So we're talking about $2,000 people for that thing. And it's a lot of running around. It's running over to order the stuff and the work. And so needless, both Stephanie and I were just a little bit grinchy over that. You know? <laughs> you know, just a little bit George Bailey, not really ready to jump off a bridge to end our lives, but just a little bit like, you know. And then, so we go over Monday night and a few of you came with us. Uh, Texan Gidget and, and Scott and uh, Vicky and uh, we have our food and and uh, you know the attitude starts to change. Soon as I get fed, yeah. everything's all is well. 
And then we sing some songs, you know, do a few songs that I wrote, and then we sing some Christmas carols, and then we get them the little bags, and uh, they all, you know, are very, very sweet and very thankful. And then they get this card, and we see the same thing year after year. When they see the $100 gift card, tears. And they got, and you know, I just immediately said in my heart, and they come up and they're so grateful. Yes. They're just so grateful because they sometimes come out of prison. They don't have any way they're going to have Christmas. And now, you know, it's not, not that big of a thing, but they can buy a few gifts or maybe buy something they need for themselves. And I see this gratitude. And we, we're so grateful because it's, it's not our money, but we represent the whole church. And so we get the, you know, that's why it's good for you to come on that evening because you need to get some credit for it. Yeah. But I, I, after all this Grinchy thing, it was like, all right, we're going to do this again next year, of course. <laughs> Probably have a little bigger party yeah. and a little more food. More you know. <laughs> but you know, those little things, we have no idea, all of us, when, when you put in a $10 bill toward that, or, or maybe $100, whatever you give toward that sort of thing, you have no idea. Yeah, the impact that may have on somebody's life and how they will pay that forward to use an overused expression. Yeah. It's a wonderful life. Amen. It's a wonderful life in the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Lord, I know that some people are just able to go, yeah, I know exactly what you're saying. And then there's probably a few in here that are going through a tr very trying thing. I know Diane with her mother just recently dying and, and now getting word that her her son-in-law uh, suddenly died and having to go down to that funeral. It doesn't seem so wonderful. Can't sort those sorts of things out. But Lord, we know that your mercies are new every morning and we know, Lord, that your kindness leads us all to repentance. And that you yourself are wonderful. And that in all of these things we are not only more than conquerors, Lord, but you will use these things to bring great blessing, not only to our own life, but to other lives. Lord, I do want to pray specifically for Diane and her family, for her daughter, uh, Jolene, that you will just keep your hand on them, God. Help them through this for their children, grandchildren, and for any others, Lord, that really identify more with jumping off the bridge than at the end of the movie when they just see how great life is. Thank you, Lord. We honor you as wonderful. I pray, Lord, that each one in here would have that wonderful, wonderful Christmas season, Lord. Not only thinking of what you've done, Lord, but together with family and friends and just celebrating you and the good life you've given us. Send us all home, Lord, today with your peace, with your joy, and in safety. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Have a great day. If any of you need uh, specific prayer, I'm here. Pastor George is here. Rick is here. And uh, we'll be happy to pray for you.